Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In last week's Gospel, near the end of Jesus' ministry, the disciples caught a glimpse of his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. And a voice from heaven declared Jesus to be God's Son and instructed us to listen to him. Now this morning, we back up three years to the beginning of his ministry. Jesus is baptized by John. He receives power from the Holy Spirit. And again, a voice declared him to be God's beloved son. And then he's immediately driven into the wilderness where there's no food, where he's surrounded by the wild beasts and he's tempted by the devil for 40 days. Think about that, 40 days, that's a long time. And you've got to wonder why. And you and I go through hard times that seem like they may never end when there's sin and suffering. But Jesus, God's Son, why did He have to go through all of this? Well, consider this story in the context of Jesus' life and mission. In the person of Jesus, God enters the world in a very personal, intimate way. God enters our world as Emmanuel, God with us, to be alongside those who are suffering, those who are hungry, those who are struggling against the forces of evil. And Jesus enters the world and announces that God has a plan to make things new and different. He proclaims the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. And Jesus Baptism is a major transition in his life. He's 30 years old and about to begin his public ministry, but first the Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness where he contemplates the mission God has sent before him. And he struggles to resist the pursuit of selfish ambition and worldly power and influence. That's what's going on here in this text. In the wilderness, the human being, the man, Jesus, is tempted to misuse the power he has been given to take for himself the glory and honor that rightfully belongs to God alone. And if you study history or simply read the newspaper in our day, you realize that our world in many ways is not that much different than the world 2,000 years ago when Jesus lived here. People have always been tempted by the acquisition of power. Jesus refused to allow Satan to control his life, but there have been many gifted and talented individuals down through the ages who have failed that test and have been led by selfish ambition to wield power over individuals and corporations and banking institutions and nations. Those who manipulate economic markets, for example, so that huge profits benefit only a very few while the other 99% of God's children continue to struggle. Now, the lust for money and influence and power entraps the human spirit and brings nothing but injustice and pain and conflict. The combination of selfish ambition and power makes the world a darker place. So what was and what is God's response to this diabolic temptation to acquire and to misuse power. God chooses to enter the world and human history completely without power. As a baby born to peasant parents 
And throughout his life, Jesus is exposed to every human vulnerability and weakness. And when he receives power from the Holy Spirit to begin his ministry, he could have sold his soul to the devil, so to speak, and amassed earthly power and glory for himself. But instead, he remains faithful to his Heavenly Father and uses the power at his disposal to feed the hungry, to heal the sick, to lift up those who are weak. And three years later, his life on earth ends as it began, completely powerless, hanging on a cross for the sake of others. In Christ, the power of this world, the power of greedy Wall Street bankers and politicians and corporate CEOs and Hollywood celebrities, that power is exposed. And God appears among us in what seems to be weakness to unmask the diabolic illusion of worldly power. The power of God is shown to us in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. The transforming power of love and compassion and truth and justice that heals and restores and brings people together and reconciles us to our Creator. Yet just as Jesus was led into the wilderness to contemplate the mission and the ministry God had set before him, at every transition in life, in this Lenten season, you and I need time to reflect, to think seriously about why we're here, what we're called to do. It's key to our success as individuals and as a congregation. It's our mission together to gather and worship and grow in the Word and serve God by serving people. That's not always easy to accomplish. And even when we have the best of intentions, Satan will still interfere. And so will other sinful people, and so will my own sinful nature. We are, as Luther says, simultaneously saints and sinners. We're saints simply because God has declared us so for Jesus' sake. Sinners because we don't always resist our selfish ambitions. We don't love God with our whole heart and we don't love our neighbors as ourselves. And all around us are influences that lead us away from doing that. When Jesus was in the wilderness surrounded by wild beasts, God sent angels to minister to him. Sometimes you and I like to think that we can go it alone, but if Jesus needed a support group, I'm pretty sure that you and I do too. Angels are often no, nothing more than messengers from God. And we need angels caring for us too, messengers from God to support us when times get tough. And that's one reason we gather for worship every Sunday and on Wednesdays during Lent. We come to grow in God's Word and be strengthened by the sacraments, but also we come to lift up and to be lifted up by other Christian friends, messengers from God who are here to support us. We need one another. During this season of Lent, we follow the journey of Jesus to the cross. We follow as Satan tries to steer Jesus away from a course that leads to undeserved suffering and death. Think about the irony in that. Satan wants Jesus to avoid the cross. Jesus came through this period of temptation with his faith renewed and his face set toward Jerusalem for your sake and for mine. He proved to himself 
and he proved to his Father in heaven that he could follow the path that God was setting before him. And as we undertake the disciplines of Lent, as we worship and study and pray and give to the poor and refrain from self-indulgence, may God grant us grace to do the same. You can be sure the harder you strive, the more you will be tempted. We pray that we may come through the season of Lent with our faith renewed and our eyes set on the promise of Easter. May you prove to yourself and to your Father in heaven that by the power of the Holy Spirit within you, you can follow the path that God has set before you. There is Easter light in the darkness of the Lenten wilderness because we are Easter people, people of faith and hope, hope in a new kind of life where people are served and where God receives the glory. May God grant it for Jesus' sake. Amen.